Greetings, brothers and sisters. You can just call me Brother Moore. Don't worry about the doctor, the professor, all that stuff. Uh, I really feel honored to be here talking with you about the book because it's for the people. That's the reason why I really wrote the book. Not so much name, recognition, money, nothing to do with that, but the ideas and the concepts that are related to melanin really deal with us as a people. But we're not the ones studying it. We're not the ones investigating it. We have a lot of misconceptions within our community about the topic, so I w wanted to put the document out there to kind of not set the record straight, but to at least provide some scientific information to give some validity to this area of research. Uh, I would like to just talk about what melanin is, how it is functioning first, and then hopefully leave some room for some questions. So I know you all have your questions. I don't want to start it off by asking, what do you know about melanin? Or well, what do you know about melanin? Because the thing is, then we will get kind of sidetracked. And everybody's going to have a different opinion, or everybody might have the same opinion. But rather than doing, do that, I want to just give you a, a sense of what melanin is. When you speak of the word melanin, you, you usually think of what you see in terms of the color of a person's skin. Well, certainly melanin does relate to a pigment. That is certainly true. But it's more than just a pigment because it has qualities that helps it to function within this universe. So when we speak of what I wrote in chapter 3, which is really the most important chapter of the book, to home in on what it is that melanin does, there are some advantages to having melanin functioning in the body. And there are three that you can think of to put in your mind. One is a neutralizer of free radicals or a neutralizer of toxic substances within the body. So it's a neutralizer. So as we're going through this discussion, try to remember, it's not just the skin melanin we're talking about. Melanin is also found inside of the body. So we'll, st we'll, dr we'll break down those other places within the body it's found, but just kind of remember that melanin itself is acting as a neutralizer of harmful substances that are in the body. Uh, the reason why we as African people may not age as quick as Europeans may, because of the melanin. It's cutting off the free radicals from destroying the cells, therefore we have a uh, much younger appearance. So you may have your 90-year-old grandmother may look 60 or something. So that has a lot to do with the way melanin is functioning. Now within the body, in terms of in the brain, when you start talking about a neutralizer of free radicals, well, just as it is a collecting these substances on the outside of the body, it can also collect them within the brain. And one of the places that's really, that's, that's rather heavily melanated or heavily uh, dark in color is the substantia nigra. Yeah, it sounds like a big word, but when you look at it, it's a Latin word for black substance. Substantia, substance, nigra, black. There's a disorder or a neurodegenerative problem called Parkinson's disease. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. People who suffer from Parkinson's disease, disease it's a neurodegenerative disorder. These, these, these cells start to deteriorate. People, they shuffle when they walk, they have tremors, they also can't initiate movements. You know, your mind is telling you to do something, but you can't actually do it. There's something going wrong in the brain. Part of the brain that's being disturbed is a part that's melanated. Well, we don't really know what the cause of Parkinson's disease is, but the thing is, people are saying that it may be accumulation of these free radicals or these toxic substances over years. Because normally you don't develop Parkinson's disease age 10, 11, 12. You get it when you're older in life. When you've eaten all the terrible things that you shouldn't have been eating throughout your life. All the things you know about pesticides and food and the, the so-called uh, cumulative effect. Because you don't just die of natural causes. You die of toxicity, poisoning over years. So the same thing could be occurring within that part of the brain called the substantia nigra. So it's, it's just absorbing those free radicals. So good on one, one, in one sense in terms of absorbing these toxic substances. But on the other hand, it could be a disadvantage. So that's why we don't want to be misled that melanin makes you great and just leave it at that, as in some books have led us to believe. The one written by <coughs> Carol Barnes, Melanin, the Chemical Key to Black Greatness. So it sounds like, oh, yeah, it's just chemical that makes us great, but we don't need to be too confused about that. The second role that I spoke of is it's acting as a nerve conduction facilitator. When we say nerve conduction facilitator, we're speaking of the way that our brains are operating can't function without a brain. The brain is the central processing unit, just like for the computer. So within certain parts of the brain, melanin can help to we say, make those nerve impulses flow a little bit better. So you may have quicker reaction times. So if we look at the eye itself, 
Some people have darker color eyes, some people have blue eyes, or light gray eyes. Well, the darker your eyes, the quicker your reaction time. So maybe people who are marksmen, uh, you know, in terms of uh, maybe even archery, those particular events, people who are, have darker colored eyes and also a dark pigment on the back of the eye towards the retina, the pigment layer, if that is dark, then this helps the person, what do say, function better in the environment in terms of focusing on these, uh, uh, the visible light that is in our environment. So when we start speak of nerve conduction facilitator, it's helping the nervous system function at a higher level. So possibly helping us vibe with the music, you know, staying on rhythm. And also talking about uh, singing, rapping, and also moving. And there's a lot of people that can't do that. There's a lot of uncoordinated people out there. And we don't want to, we don't want to just say that all black people can rap, all black people got rhythm, because you know that's not the case. But it can be maximized in people of color, okay? The third point of emphasis about melanin functioning is it acts as an energy transformer. All around us, is, there's energy pervading. We don't see the ultraviolet radiation or the visible light, but it's out there. Okay? It's, a, it's a span of, of, of wavelengths that's out there that causes us to see what we see. Then you start talking about radio bands. We well, can't see radio bands, but they're out there. Uh, microwaves, can't see them, but they're out there. So there's a there's energy pervading the universe. Well, everywhere that you see melanin in the body, it's at places where energy <coughs> conversion is happening. So speaking from the skin, speaking about the brain, those are the two main points about, again, this conversion. But speaking from the skin and the brain, everywhere you find melanin, it is functioning to convert energy. So you speak of dealing with, dealing with the eye. Converting the visible light, what you see, into nerve impulses, something that the brain can now understand to detect, to say, you, you see a glass, you see a shirt. Well, in the ear, you have melanin found in the inner ear. You don't see sound waves. You can't really see the actual say, words coming out of my mouth, but you hear something. That's energy. In the inner ear is where you find melanin. It's functioning to convert that sound, those sound waves into nerve impulses so what the brain can understand what you're talking about. Inner ear, eye. We already spoke about the brain in terms of, again, movement. So all those places in the body where you talk about energy conversion, you find melanin. And there are, there's a lot of information in terms of metaphysics. Many of you may know about the chakra system. You may know about spiritual centers that are supposed to be within the body. Some speak of the pineal gland as being the crown chakra, the number one to kind of focus on. Well, in those centers are where you, again, find energy transformation going on. And when we start talking about the skin, the skin isn't just some covering on our body. It's an organ. Matter of fact, it's the largest organ of the body. So you, you can break it down. I have a little picture in the book. I think it's diagram number three. We have on one side, we start talking about if you're in, under stress, you know, there's some hormones that have to work in the body for you to engage into this particular activity. From, don't get too confused about these names now. From the hypothalamus, you have a substance called CRF, corticotropic releasing factor, or corticotropic releasing hormone. It must go to the pituitary gland, located right here, to release something else called ACTH, adrenal corticotropic stimulating hormone. That then goes to, adrenal to the adrenal gland to kick in what's your cortisol, your glucocorticoids, to get you revved up to deal with the situation. So that's a what hormonal response, dealing with a certain organ in the body that you just talked about. But look on the other end, when you start talking about for the skin, you got within the brain something called POMC. I have it written here, but the long name of that is pro-opio-melanocortin. Certainly when you read the book, you start to understand those things, right? Pro-opio-melanocortin, pro-opio. Opio, there's some form of like opioid in there. So some, you know about opium and how that makes you feel good. Well, there's something in your body that makes you feel good, too. Pro-opium, melano, melano. There's something in there to do with making you dark in color, something within that, that structure. Cortin. That's also where you have a breakdown of this substance we're talking about, ACTH. Well, POMC can go ahead and talk to the pituitary gland to make MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which can also then go to the skin to what produce more melanin. So... This is just seeing skin color and just saying, oh, that's just a pigment. It's functioning deep within the body to make the body dark. And when the women are pregnant, you know that line from the lineus nigra, from the navel all the way down to the vaginal area? What's going on there? 
You know what I mean? It's something to do with the hormonal effects of how the melanin is being produced from the hormones here in the brain then to the skin. So it's, don't just look at the skin as some so-called covering of the body. No, it has a function within itself. And this is when we start to talk about being connected to what? The universe. All the things we know about now about dark matter. Dark matter being something out there. You can't see it. You don't know what it is, but they know it's there. And white people are saying it now in their journals. Uh, we don't know what it is. We have that, I think, in the chapter on material spiritual connection. They don't know what it is, but it's something out there. And if you saw the movie, the uh, show X-Files last night, talking about, X, talking about dark matter, this guy went to this accelerating machine, and he ended up, uh, something happened to him where it was his shadow. If people touched his shadow, then they would be taken into this energy system which relates to the dark matter. So the point I'm trying to make here with us is that the connection between us and the universe is there. Europeans are all about controlling and dominating it. It's almost like they've been detached from it. Because it has something to do with the, the body, which is nothing but really a microcosm of the macrocosm. When we say that, your body ain't nothing but a replica of what's already out there. In terms of the shape of the trees, they look just like the way that the nerve cells look like. In terms of receiving that energy and transmitting it back into Mother Earth or to the body. So in terms of all the symbolisms, they're there. I don't need to give them all right now. But look at the key in terms of people who are highly melanated and are in tune to the environment. And we can also break this down to the Native Americans, the Native peoples of this land right here. They are in tune to what? The environment. But white people ain't into that. They ain't about controlling and dominating it. So we need to understand that there's some principles there that relate to the melanin. But within those statements I just made is where some of the controversy comes into play. That's why the first chapter is on a critical analysis of the, Af of the literature that's already out there, but from an African-American perspective. And most of you, I'm certain, have read Dr. Welsing's work, the ISIS papers, correct? Mm -hmm. But when you read that, it's not really much on melanin. Her theory within the color confrontation, the crest theory of color confrontation, the two main points are that white people lack melanin, therefore they feel that they're genetically inferior. And the other point is they feel that they're, they're numerically inadequate. So since they're numerically inadequate and they lack melanin, that's why they act the way they do. Okay. All right. So that's, simplistically speaking, that's a good way of analyzing it. But when you really break it down, a whole lot of black people act the same way. So we've got to be very careful about making those statements. So I think we need to watch out for focusing on some chemical that's causing somebody to act in a certain way. So. I, I didn't want to write the book to be used as an antagonistic scholar against Dr. Wells because that's how the media would use it, you know. So I supported her, and I, I give her a lot of credit for even bringing these issues to light. A lot of people don't even talk about it. She's the only one that said, let's have a conference in New York about why black men scared of white men. Nobody else talking about those things. So I got a lot of respect for her, but the way that the issues are coming out and then the audience taking it and running with it, it's confusing. So we can't fall into the trap that there's one chemical that's causing a people to have a certain, you know, behavior. However, we do, know, we do want to focus on the scientific principles of melanin and some of the concepts related to it that does state that there's a difference. And you know all the stories in the past, oh yeah, you, you Negroes, there's something wrong with you, you know, the Negroes, put, put them away. Now they want us all to be equal. We're all in this together. We're all friends. We're the same. There's no differences. There is differences. That's the point. We need to focus on, capitalize on, rather than downing them and talking bad about them. No, let's, let's uplift them. The Asian, looks the, way, the Asian person looks the way they do for a certain reason. Respect that. European looks the way they do for a certain reason. Respect that. The African looks the way they do. Respect that. But the system now wants to act like everybody's the same. That's not the case. And it's the melanin that is the defining factor that makes us much, much different than many people. So that's a dangerous statement within itself. But I think the only controversial statements I have are around pages 70 to about 82. I start dealing with the inner ear mechanisms. And I start talking about the Michael Jordans and the MC Hammers and the Michael Jacksons. You know, I know Europeans move like they do or do what they do. And you know it ain't just from practice. There's some natural abilities that are being basically maximized. And we all have that potential. And the point is not to fall into the trap that it's some chemical creating it, but my whole point about the melanin is people who have a greater capacity to produce melanin in terms of the genetic, the genetic thing, then the greater is the maximum ability for that melanin to function at a higher level. 
So if you, again, come from a African um, background or you have genes that, again, focused on highly melanated genes, then you are more focused on having melanin function at a higher level versus a European where it's, it's, it's weeded out. But we've got to be careful about that because we know about all the things with slavery. I mean, half of us got white genes in us anyway. That's why we have such a vast array of colors within our community. So not to fall into the trap that it's just one pigment in this color that's supposed to be defining you as a people. That's, that's the problem that I'm saying is the, the myth that's out there. But we've got to understand that from a genetic standpoint, because there are many light-skinned people that are more revolutionary than the dark-skinned people. So it ain't got nothing to do with the so-called color of a person's skin. Genetically speaking, however, the greater it is, like I said, for your potential to produce melanin, and the greater it is for that melanin to function at a higher level. Those are the key concepts that I try to focus on within the document without falling into the trap saying that all black people are going to act a certain way, all white people are going to act a certain way. And the person that I spoke about to present some of the informational literature on, uh, from an African-American perspective, was Sheikh Anta Diop. Diop was the only brother that was taking this stuff to the lab. He was investigating the melanin on what's in mummies. And you know what they did? They started to hide the mummies. They got them today hidden in the back where they're not letting people know, you know, what the color of certain mummies were and during certain dynasties. But to put those ones out there that they want to be, you know, <coughs> bus, bus go by so you can really hear this. The dark-skinned white people, those are the ones that they want you to see. It's a, it's a fallacy, though, because we know about, again, the dynasties that were building things were African dynasties, period. No question. But the images that you start to put there for the people to see starts to mix people up. And Diop took him 10 years to get his PhD. I got ultimate respect for the brother who was putting out information that was questioning everything that his so-called superiors knew. He was struggling. He had to write two PhDs to get to finish up because he was questioning, no, there's no, look, these people were black, period. This was an African civilization. And that's not what they was teaching back, they ain't teaching today either, right? <laughs> so he was trying to take this to the lab. He developed, I think, the radiocarbon lab in Dakar, Senegal and was actually studying the melanin content of the mummies. So he was really focused on the scientific principles, but he wasn't into kind of making any conjectures about human behavior, and even make a statement from his book, The African Origins of Civilization, Myth of Reality, where he talks about us not falling into Nazism. I have a quote in there in the first. So those are some of the opening comments on the melanin. I'm certain you have some other issues, either dealing with melatonin, the pineal gland, anything, any other issues, I'll focus on them. But let me try to get a feel for where you some of your views on this concept. Any questions? I have that point you just made highlighted about um, white people <coughs> developing their behaviors based on where they came from, you know, in the cold regions with harsh environments and all that. I mean, what, what else do you base that on besides just, just um, conjecture? Well, it wouldn't necessarily be conjecture because you can see it in reality today. In terms of, again, Sheikh and Diop spoke about the two-cradle theory. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Two-cradle theory. One was from the northern cradle, the other was from the southern cradle. The southern cradle is speaking of the African background. The northern cradle is speaking of the so-called Euro-Asian, or the so-called Hyksos invasions, the, the mixed people, not the native African people. Well, in that environment where you're coming from north, you start talking about being xenophobic, scared of strangers. You know the whole story today. We ain't, we ain't even got to go back in history 10,000 years ago. We can go today, where you got a black family moves into a white, no, that's what it reverses. White family moves into a black neighborhood. Oh, you see that thing move down the street. We complaining, you know, talking. Black family moves to a white community. They throwing rocks at your house, busting out your windows, burning your grass, throwing crazy stuff. So we don't have to go way back then, but we can see some of the behaviors today in terms of, again, coming from the cultural experience. So we speak of, again, as, as an African people being more uh,